This is the video for the higher level section of B2.1 on membranes and transport. Now, when we talk about the fluid mosaic model, we said fluidity means how easily something can move around. That is not something that is a fixed property of cells, okay? So the components of the cell membrane can actually determine how fluid it is. So if something is less fluid and things are less able to move around, that's going to in turn make the cell membrane less permeable. So how do we control that? Well, saturated fatty acids are less fluid than unsaturated fatty acids. So phospholipids that include more saturated fatty acids going to result in less permeability. Different temperatures can also require different amounts of fluidity. So colder habitats, so I think of this like cold, I get stiff and things are hard to move around. Well, I want to make sure that the cell membrane doesn't become stiff and, you know, not movable. So in colder habitats, cell membranes are going to be comprised of more unsaturated fatty acids, again, to control that fluidity. So whether or not something has more fatty acids that are saturated or unsaturated can be dictated by its environment and how fluid it needs to be. In addition to the composition of those fatty acid tails, animal cells can add an additional feature to help regulate fluidity, and that is something called cholesterol. So this is, again, only in animal cells. And cholesterol is a molecule that looks like this. It is hydrophobic, just like the rest of the lipids. So it's going to hang out here in the hydrophobic tail region. Okay, so I'll try to kind of like circle this. Here's cholesterol, and it's nonpolar, so I would find it in the nonpolar um, hydrophobic region region of my lipid bilayer. And this, again, is something that can regulate fluidity. And if you're regulating fluidity, you're also influencing permeability. What's cool about cholesterol is that it can stabilize membranes at higher temperature and also prevent them from becoming really stiff at low temperatures. So we say that it helps regulate the fluidity of a membrane. And even if the temperatures vary, like really warm or really cold, it can prevent that membrane from becoming too fluid or too stiff. Now, membrane fluidity is a very, very important concept when we think about the formation of vesicles and the impact on moving things into or out of the cell. So vesicles look like this. Um, they are little pouches, right, made up of a lipid bilayer, and they can compartmentalize um, different regions of the cell or surround different things. And they're really important for this process called endocytosis. So let's work on our root words here. Cyto means cell. Indo means into. Okay, so I'm going to be moving things into the cell or on the inside of the cell. And this is a process of bringing materials into the inside of the cell by engulfing it. This is so cool. So what a cell can do is it can actually make an indentation in its cell membrane. And then a small piece of that membrane pinches off. So you can imagine that indentation kind of like pinching off and then surrounding that material that was once on the outside of the cell. And then once that pinching process finishes up, that now becomes a vesicle. So what's so cool is that the lipid bilayer components of this vesicle literally used to be part of the cell membrane right here. They've just been pinched off. And again, we need the cell membrane to be fluid to be able to move in order to make that happen, okay? Now, regardless of how fluid the membrane is, this is an active process, so it's going to require ATP. Now, vesicles aren't just important for endocytosis. They're also important for moving things around within a cell. We don't want components to get lost or spread out in the cytoplasm, so we use vesicles to transport things within a cell. Let's take a look at this example. Let's say that on the rough ER, okay, we've freshly synthesized a protein. See these little dots, those ribosomes on the rough ER, they are for manufacturing proteins that will eventually be exported from the cell. 
That rough ER will then take that protein and wrap it in a vesicle, which will then travel over here to our Golgi, okay? So the Golgi is going to accept that vesicle, okay? And when it does, that vesicle fuses with the Golgi and releases the contents to the inside of the Golgi. The Golgi can modify that in a lot of different ways. That's in another topic. And then it will repackage it into another vesicle, okay? And this vesicle will then fuse with the membrane to expel or excrete that material, that protein, to the outside of the cell. So these vesicles for transport are very important. That process of a vesicle fusing with the cell membrane and releasing its contents to the outside, that is something called exocytosis. So again, cyto meaning cell, exo meaning I'm going to the outside. So process of moving materials to the outside of the cell. The material to be exported via exocytosis must be wrapped in a vesicle. And that's because this vesicle will eventually fuse with the membrane. So this could be like a waste product or it could be some kind of product for secretion like a protein. It's an active process, right, to get this to happen. That means I'm going to need to supply energy in the form of ATP. But it's the vesicle part here that I want to pay close attention to. This vesicle is eventually going to become part of the cell membrane. So it needs to be made Made of the same components. So vesicles made up of a lipid bilayer, it fuses with the membrane. So what's so cool about this is that now this cell membrane contains um, parts that used to be the vesicle, which the Golgi manufactured and wrapped around that protein. Fun stuff. It just so happens to be that cells are going to use a very similar process when they want to grow. So let's say I have a cell and this cell wants to grow bigger. Cute. Well, little vesicles are going to pinch off of the rough ER. So let's say here's my vesicle um, that is coming off of the rough ER. This vesicle is going to fuse with the cell membrane. So what that will look like is this vesicle will fuse with the cell membrane and just become integrated into the cell membrane and now my cell has grown just a little bit. I've only shown you one vesicle. You can imagine if I have 20 vesicles doing that, my cell is going to expand quite a bit. So in the first part of this video, we've dug a little deeper into that like lipid bilayer and how things like vesicles really help the cell perform its functions. Now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit more about the proteins that are embedded within that lipid bilayer and how exactly they help cells um, regulate what comes in and out. Channel proteins were something we covered in the standard level portion from this topic. And channel proteins are there um, to help things that are polar or that have a charge move in and out of the cell. Cells can regulate their permeability by either having those channels or not having them, but they can also regulate the permeability by opening or closing them. And one type of protein that can open or close is something called a voltage-gated ion channel. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is a channel protein that is meant for moving ions either into or out of the cell that is going to open or close, just like a gate, based on changes in voltage. Okay, so that's kind of the definition of what it does. This, there's a lot more detail here about how voltage-gated ion channels work in a different topic, um, but for now we'll just say that this gate is a mechanism, um, and it's not really actually a gate, it's a piece of the protein that kind of like opens and closes when the protein changes shape. Why is the protein changing shape? Well, when you have changes in voltage, changes in charge on either side of the cell, it causes the protein to change shape and it can open or close. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about how this functions in neural signaling in a different topic, but for now we wanna keep our eye focused on form and function. So the form is we have this voltage-gated voltage ion channel and the function is that it can help cells move things in or out or not depending 
depending on the voltage, which is going to change at different points in a neuron transmission. So in thinking about how this plays out in transmission between two nerves, um, I want to take a closer look at something called a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Whew, that's a big name. This receptor is a protein. Okay. Now, again, this is something that's covered more in depth in our chapter or our topic on neuron signaling. Um, but this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is an integral protein, and it is is on the neuron that is going to be receiving that message. Now the message comes in the form of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is going to diffuse out of the neuron that is sending the message and it is going to attach to and bind to that acetylcholine receptor. Okay, and when that happens, it causes a change in the shape of this acetylcholine receptor and it opens up the protein. So again, we've been talking a little bit about this gate mechanism. Now, when that happens, it allows these ions that are outside of the cell to move into the cell and that is going to kick off a whole sequence of events that causes an action potential or a nerve signal or a nerve transmission to now happen in this cell, okay? So again, all of that mechanism about how neural signaling works is covered in another topic, but it's important for now that we understand the form and the function of these proteins. It is both a receptor and a channel protein for ions. Now what's really cool is that this is all reversible. So if acetylcholine detaches, the shape changes and whoop, the gate is going to close. And so this is one of the ways in which cells use their proteins to regulate what's coming in and out of the cell. Now, when I mentioned that ions are going to move into the cell, they're only going to do that if a concentration gradient has been established. So remember, ions are gonna move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So if we want that to happen, we first need to establish an area of high concentration. And to do that, we're going to need active transport, specifically a protein pump. Now, in a nerve transmission, we need to keep an eye on two ions, sodium and potassium. So there's a really cool protein pump called the sodium-potassium pump. Remember, they are specific to the ions that they pump. Um, and it's going to use ATP to establish a concentration gradient. So what it does is when ATP binds to this protein, it causes a change in shape and it's going to force sodium to be pumped to the outside of the cell, okay? So we're gonna have three sodium ions pumped outside of the cell, that's what extracellular means, and two potassium ions pumped into the cell. So this awesome protein pump is forcing both of these to move against the concentration gradients, okay? And it's doing both of them at the same time. Super cool. So it actually has a double function here, okay? So it's establishing a high concentration of sodium out of the cell and a, a high concentration of potassium inside the cell um, via protein pumps, which require ATP. And because it's doing both of them at the same time, um, we call it an exchange transporter. So exchange, it's doing double duty. It's doing both of those ions at the same time, um, just in opposite directions. And again, this uh, topic is about form and function. Um, you don't need to necessarily know how they function in nerve uh, transmission in this topic, but overall, it's important to be able to relate those ideas um, of how nerve transmissions work, that's in um, theme C, but also how we establish those concentration gradients to begin with, and that's in this topic on form and function um, of the membranes and how that works with transport. Next, we'll talk about an example of something called indirect active transport. And we'll be looking at this example of sodium dependent glucose co-transporters. So this is exactly what it sounds like, co meaning with. It's a transport protein that is going to move sodium and glucose at the same time. 
both of these molecules are going to end up moving into a cell. So this is going to start with a sodium potassium pump. And I've drawn that here in black, okay? This sodium potassium pump is going to use ATP as an energy source to actively pump sodium ions outside of the cell. Now, this accomplishes something really useful, which is a high concentration of sodium ions. So at this time, there's a high concentration of sodium ions outside of the cell and a low concentration of sodium ions inside of the cell. We had to use ATP to do that. Okay, there is also a low concentration of glucose outside of the cell and a higher concentration inside of the cell. But the whole reason for doing this is we wanna be able to get that glucose into the cell. Okay, the problem here is, is that we're moving it against the concentration gradient. So ordinarily, this would also require active transport, but remember, we've just pumped this sodium outside of the cell. So this sodium is going to move into the cell through the co-transporter, okay, and it's moving from high concentration to low, but when it does that, it's also going to bring the glucose with it. So because this sodium is moving from high concentration to low, it's moving passively through this co-transporter. And even though we're taking glucose from an area of low concentration to high concentration, it's still going to be passive because it's coupled with the passive movement of this sodium ion from a high concentration to low. So this is exactly how glucose is reabsorbed in the kidneys, if you've learned about that already. And energy is required, but it's indirect because it's not the energy that we're not using the energy for this part for moving the glucose. The energy is used to establish the high concentration of sodium ions on the outside of the cell using the sodium potassium pump. So again, this is an example of what we call indirect active transport, and we're using a protein called a co-transporter. Now the last specialized protein function we'll talk about is something called a CAM or cell adhesion molecule. And these are very important for tissues. Tissues are many cells working together to perform a common function. So what I've drawn here are like some cells, let's say these are cells in your intestines and their goal is to get maybe like food molecules, okay, to go from inside the intestine into like your bloodstream, like a capillary, okay? So we'll have that somewhere down here. Well, it's really important that things only go in this one direction. What we don't want is any food molecules kind of like escaping in between cells. So to prevent that, cells use these things called cell adhesion molecules. They are proteins that basically help these cells form really, really tight junctions, okay? So they're going to help cells join together and form a tight junction so that molecules are going where they belong and not kind of like getting lost in between these cells.